Uh, it's great to be here. I'm going to try to bring a little Ohio to uh, South Dakota. I uh, hate to pick on you, but it's only 50 degrees here, <laughs> you know. But uh, the first picture here is our farmstead, and this happens to be a December picture. And as you can see, that uh, our neighbors are not doing what we like for them to do just yet, but uh, uh, we're starting to influence a few of them around us, and things are working fairly well. Uh, so this would be uh, when you get to our house and you're all invited to come anytime you'd like to. If you're in a, around Columbus, Ohio, we're about 12 miles southeast of there. Uh, when you hit a green field, you'll know you're close to where we farm. So uh, begin this uh, begin this by how we started. The reason I started back in 70 was erosion was a problem on our farm. Uh, and I knew we had to do something to uh, control it. So this is typical of how the fields looked uh, in the spring just before we plant. So you had a lot of things we had to do. And uh, we were losing about 20 ton of soil a year from doing our tillage practices. And uh, in 70, I began no-tilling. Uh, in 78, I started working with cover crops uh, and learning how to make those work. And we began with uh, winter peas after wheat uh, using single species for seven to 12 years after we started because we didn't know there was a difference in uh, doing multiple species at that time. And we'll progress through this and give you the idea how we progressed. Uh, and hopefully we can give you some ideas to take back to your farms to uh, uh, add some more cover crops or diverse cover crops in your operation. And we really like, really like spring peas or winter peas. Uh, they seem to survive the winter here pretty well if they only get about 12 or 14 inches tall. If they tend to be taller than that, they do winter kill here. And they probably will do the same in South Dakota, you know. Uh, the reason I like them so well, they had a, a primary root that you can see here in the slide with uh, the white nodules at the uh, two inch level, the uh, five to six inch level, and then at the very bottom of the uh, uh, shovel there of nine inches, you'll see nitrogen. And the reason I like this, this puts a lot of nitrogen in the soil. Uh, and we are able to have nitrogen for corn plants at the two inch level, at the knee high, when we're gonna do lay by, we get a lot of nitrogen and then at determining test weight on corn uh, at the nine inch level in August. So we have a slow release nitrogen that stays in the soil for us year round and uh, gives us a nutrient we need for corn. Uh, we've worked at other clovers. This is a, called a crimson clover. I saw this in uh, North Carolina and I brought a bag home from there after I spoke one time there. And interesting thing, I talked to the Ohio State University and asked them how to to use this as a cultivar in our operation. And they told me it won't grow north of the high river, but guess what it does, you know? So we can take plants from other places and bring them. They may not mature, they may not make seeds, but they make great roots and bring lots of things to our soils that we usually don't think can happen, you know? Uh, we like hairy vetch extremely well. Uh, it grows ex good here and I think it grows a, I talked to Gabe Brown several times and he gets good results with hairy vetch. And uh, it's a great nitrogen source and a great soil loosener on the surface. Uh, and we're trying to, what we're trying to do here is capture nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it in our soils to help us reduce our nutrient inputs for the year. Uh, this is normally what our wheels look like in the spring. Uh, this has a rye, hairy vetch, winter pea, and crimson clover. Uh, this was a 10-year set-aside farm that we rented five years ago. We went in in August and terminated the uh, the species that was there from the 10 years of CRP and planted this mix and uh, didn't want to do the tillage because we wanted to go to corn. And the results was this is what we had in the spring. So in the picture, you'll see at the very bottom, uh, Balanza clover, which is the, the white bloom. 
As we move up in the profile, you'll start to see crimson clover growing, some hairy vetch blooming, and, and then a lot of rye at the very top of the picture. And here we figure we've got about 150 to 200 pounds of nitrogen stored in the soil for our corn crop for next year. Uh, and even would make a good forage crop for cattle, I think, you know. And what we've done in the past, we didn't know how much nitrogen we could accumulate from these plants. So I worked five years doing uh, single species covers like these and running uh, yield trials from zero nitrogen to 200 pounds. Uh, and wherever the clover, or the hairy vetch, or the winter pea hit the same yield as the 200 pound did, that's how I figured how much nitrogen I got from those legumes. So if we look at the very bottom, we got sun, hemp, and cow peas, which is a warm season legume that grows extremely well where it's hot and dry and no water. Uh, cow peas and sun hemp uh, only need about uh, a 16th to an eighth inch of water or some dew every now and then to make them grow. They love the heat, so they get big and they put a lot of nitrogen in the soil. And then if we look at winter pea, hairy vetch and crimson clover as our cool season legumes. Uh, and we don't know what mother nature's throwing at us in August and September in Ohio. So uh, we plant a little bit of all these to make sure that we have the diverse root systems and the diverse plants we need in case mother nature puts a cold snap on us or a warm season or a warm snap to work. So as you can see, we can accumulate probably 400 units of nitrogen. Not all that's going to be available the first year. And I just kind of count on half of what we see there is working. So we can get about 210 to 220 pounds of nitrogen from our legume crops if we allow them to go to, uh, to flower. In 69, I met Steve Groft out of Pennsylvania that uh, – had come out with a tillage reddish, and we did a lot of research for Steve. And there we began to learn that we could use two species in the soil a lot better. So we could plant the reddishes in one row and the winter peas in a row beside it 15 inches apart. We used a white planter. It was an eight row 30 with seven splitters. We could put a sugar beet plate in to plant the reddish and they really did well because they were taking nitrogen from our winter peas, making a bigger tuber, as you can see in this picture. And this reddish was in the ground about 22 inches deep. And I call this my mini storage tanks for nutrients for my corn crop for next year. And I'll show you a little later how that works. So there's the field of peas and radishes we planted together with our white planter. Uh, we used uh, three quarters of a pound of uh, of uh, rape se or reddish seeds and 15 pound of winter peas because we used a soybean plate for the winter peas worked really well and uh, we had a great success in doing two species at once as we learned about these reddishes they tend to come out of the ground when they hit the compacted layer and I, I feel that the tuber come out of the ground to get enough weight to push that tap root through the hard pan and then went on. So we would find actually that the tuber would come up about seven or eight inches where the plow pan was. Then it would push that tap root through the plow pan and then the soil would be loosened back up underneath there and the tuber would get big again. And by using radishes in a row, we ended up with what I'm going to call natural strip tillage because the reddish will actually lift the soil about three to four inches and uh, works pretty well. Worked again with Dr. Lafique Islam from Ohio State and they've done a five-year trial on our farm and this was additional nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium that we found in the soil at planting time above what our soil sample readings were giving us. So. As you can see, when we talked about our reddishes being mini storage tanks, you can see that we stored a lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphorus, a lot of potash, and actually have some calcium to go along with that and some sulfur. 
Uh, we're sulfur deficient in Ohio because they've quit the coal burning power plants. Uh, so we're seeing uh, that we need to add sulfur. So now we don't have to by using the reddish in our mix. It's important to me to have a three year rotation. I think it makes it a lot easier to use cover crops because after we can take the small grain off, we can plant a, a multiple species cover crop, which will give us about a 35 to 60 day more window of growth, which will allow the plants to get bigger and do a lot of things to loosen the soil, to, to bring nutrients to the surface, to collapse of nitrogen from the atmosphere, and keep the soil covered because that's the key on regenerative ag is to build a diversity in the system and keep the soil covered and uh, uh, go to no-till. So this would be one of our big blends that we like to use after wheat. Uh, we like the sunflowers because it tends to tell our neighbors that we're not growing just weeds, we're growing things to do things right. And it's interesting with um, elderly landladies, if you take four or five of those to them every Monday for about a month, as long as they're blooming, uh, David can do no wrong as far as their farming is concerned, you know. But as you can see, we have lots of sunflowers. We have other tall plants. We got oats in that mix. We have a winter peas in that mix. And we'll talk about that here just a little bit later. Uh, if we're looking to build carbon, we can do it. In 2012, it was our driest year ever. We only had eight inches of rainfall during the year. Normally our rainfall events are between 35 to 40 inches uh, here in Ohio. Uh, so this is a mix that Ray Archuleta des designed for us and we tried it and uh, we planted this on August uh, or July the 23rd. This was September 23rd, two months later, with no rain after it was planted uh, in a six-year no-till cover crop field. And this is the kind of results we got. And as you can see, a lot of biomass. And I was on the phone with Ray saying, ask him how I'm going to plant corn in this. And he told me not to worry. So it worked out really well. Uh, this is another mix that we like. And uh, this has pearl millet, and uh, in the front you can see the millet, and on the sides you can see the uh, sun hip growing really well. And this year it was about 105 or 6 degrees here, so these plants did extremely well for us in Ohio. Uh, there's a little buckwheat in there and cowpeas in the back, and uh, really brings a diverse root system that really tends to loosen the soil and build quite a bit of organic matter. With this mix in Ohio, we can gain about 1% organic matter a year when we get to biomass above 30,000 pounds of green biomass going into winter. Again, we talk about how beneficial insects and how flowering things bring them. So on our farm today, we have not used a fungicide or insecticide for 10 years. Uh, because of the amount of beneficial insects we have and uh, the things in our soil that really help us to do what we need to do to keep our plants healthy. Some years it's really fun to plant as it was in 2017. Uh, everything worked well. We had a great spring, stuff grew well. And as you can see, as we're planting, the planter almost rolls it all down perfectly and then we come back after we plant with a crop roller to terminate what's growing and blooming that it didn't lay the planter didn't lay down. And these years when it's like this, it's pretty easy to make decisions on what you need to do. You plant and you roll. You don't need to use much herbicides or any herbicides, very little nutrients, and you can have successful crops. Then we look at 2018. It was a cold spring stuff. We had snow the first day of May. The cover crop didn't get very big. So here we have to make a management decision for how we're going to terminate it, what nutrients we're going to use because our plants didn't get big enough to give us the root growth and pick up the nitrogen out of the atmosphere that we wanted. So this year we had to use 
some more nutrients. And this seems to be the thing we see with regenerative agriculture. It takes more management, and you have to be understanding what you're doing to be successful. Uh, this is our crop roller. We have planted soybeans here in the rye. Now my wife is rolling down the rye for the uh, to terminate it because it's all in bloom. And as you can see, it's a 30-20 with a 20-foot crop roller. A no problem with pulling. It really pulls kind of easy. And as you can see, when she goes by, it lays that residue down like a carpet. So we have about two and a half inch thatch of carpet here, and this will all it will suppress all the uh, broadleaf weeds that we have. So this year we got by without a chemical use. And then here comes the corn through the residue. And as you can see, the corn's dark green. It's not suffering from anything, doing fairly well uh, with uh, less inputs from our farm. The thing I like to talk about is how we can control the temperature. As you can see on the left is the uh, temperature of the soils underneath our cover crop. And that's about seven to eight degrees. And on the right is my conventional neighbor's field. Uh, the corn was planted about three weeks before in the no-till field, the corn's just barely coming up, but we'll catch him because today his soil is 97 degrees and his plants are starting to slow down and go into defensive mode to keep them alive because of the heat and lack of moisture, as you can see with the ground cracking and uh, how his compaction is on the surface here. So that's what we see with cooler temperatures that we can soon catch the corn and all harvest times, we're at the same day of harvesting as he is. So we work out really well on that. Again, this is what we plan into. You can see the planter on the right side of the picture. It's a white planter. And uh, my grandson came back to the farm four years ago and we, the second year we went to lunch and he was telling me, he says, there was green planters everywhere. And he says, Grandpa, why don't we own a green one? And I told him uh, the simplest thing I could figure out was that uh, if we had a green and went to lunch, we probably couldn't find it when we come back to the field, you know, because of the cover crop will cover up. But this is really fun to plant into. We have enough nutrients here when we have crops this way that we don't have to add fertilizer and we don't have to use chemicals. Again, we'll just show you how nice it is to plant. Look at the planter, how clean it is. There's not a lot of dust on it. The tractor takes less horsepower to pull it with that residue cover. And as you can see, if you're not in the field prior to planting, you can use a marker arm and still see where you're going. Uh, interesting thing, this tractor takes about nine gallon an hour pulling this planter into cover crops. On the field to the right, you can see is my uncle's and it's conventional tills. And we plant his corn. There it went to about 14 gallon an hour pulling that same planter. It just pulls harder in that loose soil. So there's some small things that we can save uh, as we do regenerative ag and no-till and cover crops, uh, we can save on fuel consumption. Uh, we save wear and tear on equipment as we go. I uh, just want to show you this picture. This was 42,000 pounds of green biomass with hairy vetch and crimson clover. We ran a handy test on this farm a week before we started planting, and it came back that we had 240 pounds of nitrogen stored in the soil for our corn crop for this year. So you can see how valuable it is to have these legume crops mixed with your, your grass crops or cereal crops to keep the carbon and nitrogen ratio balanced and also to store those nutrients in the soil. David, There's David, was, hey, David yes. can you hear me? How much did you say that was on there for pounds per acre? 274 pounds of nitrogen stored in the soil for this corn crop. Oh, the peas, oh, the, the rye and oats, or the rye and oh, grass. Rye and, vetch and, and stuff, yes, and peas. So, so I just want to show you this, this picture. It just shows you how well we can cut the residue. As when it's green, it cuts really easy. And you can see the corn coming up there. It's really dark green, and uh, 
no problem getting through that residue. It just jumps right up. Some interesting, interesting things we're trying to figure out is how we can promote the sale of our commodities better. So now we're looking at, are we more nutrient dense? Our yields are the same as our conventional neighbors, maybe a little bit better. Uh, so we're looking at if we use no fertilizer, our corn's running about 9.1 protein. If we use half rate fertilizer, which is normally what happens here or less, we lower it a little bit. My agronomist said, well, you got to put more fertilizer on to get more yield. Well, we didn't increase the yield, but we did lower the protein, went down to seven. And our neighbor's conventional corns are running about 5%. So surely you can see the advantage of having cover crops and reduced tillage and having those roots there in the soil to bring nutrients to the, to the plants. Uh, some things we like to talk about is our cost for corn. This was done in 18. If you want to look at this for a while, you can multiply those figures times two. It would be about what it's going to cost in 23. You know, so we're looking at cover crop cost in the spring or in the, in the summer before. So it's $25 for that. We use non GMO seeds, which is about $66 an acre. Our average burn down herbicide over a five year period is about $9.72. Some years we don't have to use it and some years we do. So that would be our annual cost. A little bit of starter fertilizer or a little bit of nitrogen. So that would be our total NP and K bill would be about $28 a year. Our equipment costs, uh, Chris figured this out. It's the fuel, the oil, the maintenance, uh, the tires, fixing the flat tires, it's not replacement. That's just what we call it, have in uh, acre cost uh, to keep that piece of all the equipment running. Our average cash rent is about $150. It's now about $200 uh, for 23. So our total cost in 18 was $334. Uh, corn was worth $3.11. It took 107 bushel to break even. Our corn averaged 192 that year, so we made about $226 an acre profit uh, by doing regenerative bag and uh, those kind of things. Uh, so this is not a yield map. Uh, we changed our yield monitor. So we, we input the cost, and then it will print out a map, return per acre map. So as you can see, we've got pretty good returns in some part of this field. Uh, uh, on the left-hand side, it looks like a letter T or an L. That happens to be a waterway that's in the field. The little dots is where Grandpa stopped and didn't turn the planter on quick enough or didn't let it down quick enough at the end of the field. Uh, so grandson says, he could, I, I need to do a better job at that, you know, to get more corn there. But uh, – you know, this is pretty respectable of our yields or our return per acre on our maps, you know. Uh, this is called a crabbit beetle. We we started seeing these coming back after we dropped out the seed corn treatment seven years ago. So we no longer use any seed treatments on our corn. We wait till the soil temperature gets to be about 57 to 58 degrees. Uh, which means we're planting the last of May to the 1st of June, which is about everybody else has done around us. But we see these coming back, and this critter can eat about nine or ten slugs a night. He also eats a little foxtail seeds and some giant ragweed seeds to clean out his gullet. And uh, we're seeing these about seven or eight of these in every shovel full of soil that we dig out here on the farm today. So we have eliminated our slug problem by using a natural pest against them. So that's really a benefit for our farm. We can plant brown. We tried this several years ago. This was done in 2009. When you plant ground, plant, turn it brown before planting and the weather don't go against you, it works fine. But if the weatherman's wrong and it rains three or four inches, this soil will never dry out because you put a a thatch on it where the wind 
or the sunlight can't get down there. And if you don't have some way to take some of that subsurface water away, it will stay wet for a long time. And so we learned not to burn this off like this and make it brown. We always try to plant green. And this is how we plant our soybeans. Uh, we just go out with a planter and start planting and then use the crop roller afterwards. Uh, interesting thing where the brown was two weeks before, we actually lost four bushels, five bushels of beans compared to where it was green in this field. This is a slide I borrowed from Rick Clark. He's a friend of mine in, in, in Indiana. He's also an organic 5,000 or 6,000 acre farmer. I thought it was interesting to look at the size of the rye versus a biomass versus a nutrient. So if you look at 12 inch tall rye, he has about 2000 pounds of green biomass on the soil. If we let it grow to 18 inches tall, we pick up uh, about 30 pounds of nitrogen and we pick up 2000 pounds of green biomass, you know. If it's 28 inches tall, which would be about knee high, look what it does. We go to 6,800 pounds of green biomass. So if you could get your right taller, just think of how much protection you'll put on the soil and also to inhibit raindrop from moving the soil as we do this. An interesting thing I thought was the dead rye, two months after that, he still had some nutrients found. He had 60, 84 pounds of nitrogen, about 64 pounds of phosphorus, and about 50, 65 pounds of potash. So I think what I can say here is as we have some rainfall events during the summer and you have residue on the surface and the raindrop hits the residue, we are getting some nutrient release from these uh, cover crops going back into the soil to help our plants grow. You know, so this is really the advantage of having cover crops and eliminating some of the erosion, you know. So here comes the beans after planting. These are drilled beans in 15 inch row or seven inch rows. This is about five days after planting. And here's our results. About 72 bushel beans. And as you can see, pretty well weed free uh, in this field. If you'll notice and can see it close, look how close the pods are on these beans. And I think what happens as we use rye in corn fodder fields that maybe have a little bit of nitrogen left over from the corn crop, we tie that nitrogen up so the beans put more nodulation on, which means they set nodes closer and bigger and more beans in the pod. And we've seen that quite often. So if you're not used to using rye after corn, to grow soybeans, you can pick up two or three bushels just by having a rye in your mix or in your rotation. Some of our costs for our rye and our bean cross is the cover crop is $9, our seed cost is 42. We use no fertilizer for our soybeans. The equipment costs is less because all we're using is a planter and a combine and a crop roller. Our rent's about the same. So we had $235.18. Uh, beans were worth $8.40. It took 28 bushel to break even. We had to reach 72 bushel. So we put we we made about $369 profit per acre uh, on our cover crops with soybeans. Again, just another yield for a uh, Return on investment map uh, on a farm that we run, and this is a 30-acre field. The, the line you see in the center is five years ago, we had to dig a line from the electric company from the road to the farm to put three-phase power in. They made us dig a 42-inch ditch so they could be in the bottom of the ditch when they laid the three-phase power line in. So this is what disturbance has done to us on this field so cut, it has cut some of our yield and we're slowly bringing it back, but it's taken a while, you know. So that's what disturbance does to you when you're used to using no-till and cover crop. We do a lot of research on our farm to learn. 
And so we grow a lot of soybeans and corn in test plots and do some interseeding work. So this would be what we found in 18. And I thought it was interesting. If you go down part of the way down, I'm sorry about all the figures, but look over as a net farm return and you'll find $59.66. That was 111 day variety of corn. We had another 111 day variety of corn from that company made us $228 more per acre than variety A did. So this is how important to learn what you're doing on your farm and do some test work to find out because supposedly the 111 day corn that made 59 is what they call a racehorse corn. It tends to only put on about a three or a four ounce a year. The other 111 day corn is called a workhorse, which has the ability to flex and have a better ear. And I think that was the reason we saw those yields differences in 18. So it was interesting to see how varieties respond just with different kind of covers. Nothing else had changed. We do a lot of interseeding work here. This is our high boy sprayer. We take the sprayer tank off. We put a Montag seed box on the back and then use air tubes on the boom. Uh, we can cover 39 rows at a time and we can blow 10 different species at about five mile an hour in the field. Uh, pretty labor intensive and pretty expensive, but it's one way to get cover crops out in the field uh, when you have standing crops. I think this will be the new innovation way to do it. It looks like we can come in and interseed uh, cover crops. We can also, if you need to side dress a little nitrogen, you can put urea with the, with your cover crops and blow it out there. Uh, you have to be concerned with your chemicals. Make sure that your chemicals don't have a long residual window because there's no use to spend 30, 25 or 30 bucks an acre for cover crop and then have the chemical take it out. So you need to make sure you work with your agronomist to make sure this will work. But this seems to be working extremely well for us to get cover crops established in our fields when you're in a corn bean rotation. Uh, here's just a sample. This is this was some soybeans and some other legumes that we put in this crop uh, and planted the corn and then went in and put two rows of cover crop in between them. And you can see how dark green that corn is and it's really helping it out. So, and we got ground cover for next year. Again, here's where we blew some clover in. This would be going back to corn. So this would be a clover vetch mix. So it would be two years corn and then, and then rye, soybeans, and then wheat. Uh, but this way we can get some nitrogen fixing going on in this corn crop. Uh, this is uh, uh, blown in uh, radishes, uh, grape, and rye, taking the corn off and what really we see here, it's about five or six inches tall. And this actually helps us if we have a wet fall. This actually helps hold up the combine. And we are able to roll through the fields a lot easier with this cover rather than having bare soils. Uh, this is a sample of crimson clover, hairy batch, and winter peas after soybeans going to corn. When we took the beans off, these plants were about two inches tall. And there, you can see the soil in between. This is two weeks later after we took the top off and it got a lot of sunlight. And that's how fast these cover crops can grow after establishment in a corn bean wheat rotation or corn bean rotation, you know. And then we just, this is spread rye uh, after we've taken the corn off with a fertilizer spreader. You can do it lots of different ways. Uh, you'll have to change your seeding rates to some expense when you're going to just throw it out there, but uh, still an economical way to get it done to have cover. And what we've done here, we went from from 20 ton of soil loss to 5 ton of soil loss to less than 100 pounds per acre a year. So if you think about saving a ton of soil in Ohio, it's about worth 9 or $10 a ton of nutrients lost. So we went from, from five ton to a uh, hundred pounds. So, you know, we're looking at 45 or 50 bucks an acre a year 
that we can actually reduce our nutrients that we have to buy because we're not losing them anymore. And that's the key thing is learning how to reduce your nutrient load as you put cover crops and no-till in your situation. Uh, this picture is just to show you that we're trying to mimic Mother Nature. So if you look behind my cap there, you'll see our woodlot, and you'll see their different sizes and different species, different heights. And we do the same thing in our cover crop. So we have plants that's six or seven inches tall, all the way down to two inches tall plants growing underneath this cover for next year. How can we utilize this cover? Now we're trying to do that in the in the past two years. We've, we've released our crop ground to uh, some beef cattle operators that bring stalkers. We found our average daily gain here in the last two years has been 4.1 pound per day, putting on 500 pound stalkers. The neat thing is they're here for about uh, 75 to 90 days. Uh, they'll go back, they'll leave about weighing 850 to 900. And it don't take very much to finish them in from then on, you know. They do really well. And when the, it looks like this, we're trying to leave 50% there. So this is about where we're going to start moving them out because we want to make sure we have enough cover so that we can deter that raindrop when it hits the soil. Uh, and as you can see, they really enjoy it. You know, uh, things work really well. And uh, uh, the cattle do really good on it. This year we graze sheep instead of cattle. Uh, this was just before the frost, as you can see the reddishes and the sheep in the field. And this really worked well. We had 247 ewes on, uh, on 64 acres and we mob grazed two acre paddocks and moved them every other day. Worked extremely well and was real happy with it. As you can see, this is a little movie with the sheep eating and uh, I think our neighbors thought we were nuts, but uh, it worked really well. And the guy was really pleased with the results of uh, of what he saw with these uh, ewes in the field. Uh, cover crops for a high, you know, we have grasses, legumes, brassicas, and broadleaves. And this is kind of what the mix looks like as we put it in the drill. We found that if we do less than 50 acres at a time, we have no segregation problems. If we pass 50 acres, the sunflowers and some of the some of the peas will come to the surface and uh, the smaller seeds go to the bottom of the drill. So we try not to put more in a drill than 50 acres at a time and just keep reloading. We offer crop rollers to people. We have a small one for small farmers that we lease out to them and uh, for backyard gardeners. We also make a poor man's crop roller, which is a two by four with an angle iron bolted to it. It's a little more time consuming, but it'll still work. So you don't need to buy expensive stuff to make this work. Uh, we do a lot of precision things on the farm and this happens to be my pumpkin planter. And it has a fluted colder in the front, a seed colder and a covering wheel. Uh, there's a funnel there and a, the seeds in between the the fellow's legs, a 200 pound weight there to make it work. At 10 o'clock, he's bitching because he's hot. So if we give him air conditioning and then at noon, the planter won't go into ground as well. So we take the 250 pound weight off and put the 400 pounder on it and we're off and running again. And we can do this in little small products around our farm. We have a lot of five acre farms that we're utilizing to grow uh, specialty crops for the public. Uh, and this is my lovely wife, and this is the pumpkins that we planted, just to show you how well they grow. And if you look over her shoulder, behind there, there's her houses, and that was 200 acres two years ago that we put corn and beans on, and now it has 500 homes. So we have to learn to adapt. We have to adapt our, our sales to meet the demand around our community, and that's what we're doing. Again, this is our soil pit. Uh, this is after 20 or after 40 years of soils. If the very bottom, you can see the yellow clay at the bottom. It was that way all the way to the top. Now we have 30 inches of dark colored granular soils that allow us 
lots of infiltration. We can infiltrate now uh, about uh, six inches an hour, or if you use the ring in 30 seconds, the water's gone in our infiltration ring. We're building lots of abyssal mycorrhiza, and this is the only mycorrhiza you can see within with your with your eyes without using a microscope. But this is what we want in our soils. And if you do tillage, you add air to this and disturb it, so it leaves, goes up in the atmosphere. Here you can see how nice it is communicating with the root systems, giving them energy and nutrients they need to grow through the growing season. And what we're after is clean water in the front here. You'll see our clean water in the front and our neighbor's water on the left coming down. Uh, this is an 80-acre 80 80 watershed uh, with a 10-way species in it. And you can see how clean the water is leaving our farm, going into the side ditch or going into the creek beside of us. And this is our neighbor's. There's a, ja a vast difference between here and here. And you can see the amount of runoff, less runoff, a lot more erosion on the side of his hills, and a lot of his nutrients leaving as he leaves today, you know. So our results are cover crop in the forefront, corn in the back for next year, corn this year, cover crop in the front, you know. Really, we can get good, decent yields. We do a lot of work with edge of the field monitoring. So now we have a flume on our farm that they're trying to collect water from a 45 acre surface water runoff. And I must brag that in two years, they've only had a half inch of rain go through this flume after a six inch rainfall event. You know, we also do it on a field tile and we're also doing it with our neighbor. So this is ours at the top. And it gives you the location of the tile and where the flume is. You can see how small the flume is here. And our neighbor's farm, right across the road, you can see how big the flume is and everything on his conventional ground. Very interesting to see how short a flow he has in his tile versus how long our flow is with infiltration from this big sponge of cover crops and everything. Uh, so this is our, we're doing reg, regen grains. We are doing milling for corn and beans and, uh, and wheat, uh, to the public. So if there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. Hey, questions for David. Yes. Go right ahead. What's your spacing on your corn? Repeat that, please. What's the spacing on your corn? Well, the spacing is 30 inch corn, and we're running 30, 30 to 32,000 seeds per acre. Do you do any composting or compost extracts? Uh, we are starting this year. We have built a Johnson Sioux reactor and it's percolating here in the shop. And uh, we are gonna start and try to see if we can totally eliminate our bought nutrients for this next year. With your amount of mass that you're planting into with your corn, do you have any trouble with emergence? Uh, do you put any extra starter down for that? Um, do we have any trouble with emergence? Uh, we have not had trouble with emergence. Uh, we have better success with non-GMO corn emergent than we do GMOs for some reason. But we've never had a problem with get, not getting a stand, you know. I see that there's tanks on your planters. Are you running a starter fertilizer? Or are you running a biological product? Are you doing anything with biological products? Um, sometimes it depends on uh, soil temperature. If our soil temperature is under 55 degrees, we'll run a, a starter fertilizer, and we're running two gallon of a 924.3. Uh, 
if it's a new farm, we'll have some biologicals there. If it's past uh, two years of no-till and one year of cover, we don't see any benefit of the biological, so we drop them out. Uh, and uh, if it's over 55 or 58 degrees, uh, and it looks, the forecast is going to be warm, we will discontinue using starter fertilizer. Dave, could you explain your plant or how it's set up? Uh, we have a fluted colder, which is a 24 wavy colder, which opens a, a slot about uh, seven eighths of an inch wide. We have a seed, two seed disc it, that runs in that seven eighths inch uh, slot that the colder makes. And then we're using rubber press wheels in the back, uh, discontinued using cast iron and tried row clean or spike closing wheels, but they wrap too much. So we're back to the rubber and it works really well. What are you doing for testing? You do any PLFA or what do you do? Uh, we're, do we're using the Haney test uh, yearly uh, on all of our fields, just so we can have a uh, pretty good idea of where we what we're doing as we change cover crop species and uh, we use a PLFA every four year four or five years to see how many critters we can bring put in the soil you know have you seen your numbers change much after being uh, so far into this we are really well balanced with our micro with our critters in the soil through the PLFA test. They will count the microbes, the bacteria, and the protozoa, and the nematodes and the spiders. Uh, if we take on a new farm, we find that it is highly bacteria driven. Normally, they have no protozoa, no critters, or anything like that, uh, and hardly any earthworms. And that's when we use. Uh, that's why we try to use uh, lots of radishes. With our, with our blends to help uh, break the compaction. And also we found that the reddish is a, uh, when it decomposes in the spring, it is a sugar, like a sugar. And the earthworms are attracted to that and they get more, act, more activity around the reddish than we do anywhere else. Dave, what was that a little black bug called that you showed? It's called a crabbit beetle. And it will eat slugs. How do you spell that, David? Ooh, that's uh, C A B. I don't really, I can't remember. Sorry. Grab it. David, what's your, uh, especially with the flour and the specialty crop, how do you get that to consumers? What's your market strategy there? Our market strategy is we uh, started a website on the internet, and that's how our sales began. Uh, we have went out to a few bakers and showed them the product that we're milling, and uh, actually can mill flour to their specifications, and that's really helped us. You know, but most of it's been done over the internet. Okay, we got a spelling on that beetle. It's Carabid, C A R A D I D. Yeah, that's it. Yep, A D. Yep. <laughs> David, are you going to do any DNA testing on your uh, compost, on your extract? Right, you use like biomakers or anybody like that? Uh, we're going to send some off. We haven't done anything yet with it. Uh, I thought we'd kind of wait till it gets closer to planting, and then we'd send it off to see uh, what our microbial herd is in our compost tea, you know. But we will do some testing, yes. So have, have you applied any compost? Or no, I have not, have not done that. Uh, I'm just, you know, we're in a, we're in a learning stages on that one. And, uh, uh, 
I guess that's all I can tell you. We're just trying to learn how to use it, utilize it at this point. Anything else? Do you have a standard rotation, David, or do you? Yeah, we have a, our, our rotation is corn, followed by uh, rye, followed by soybeans, followed by wheat or small grains. Uh, we don't grow a whole lot of wheat anymore. Most of our small grains are for our seed business or our specialty grains for the milling. And from the small grains, we go to our large cover crop and then back to corn. And we try to do it on a third, a third and a third basis. So each year we know if we see a field that's had soybeans, we know it's going to have a small grain in it in the fall. You know, makes it somewhat easy management that way for us. You can get rye established easy after corn, maybe? Or do you plant in, what time do you plant rye into your corn? Uh, we'll try to do some interseed. We'll get about half of it interseeded in the summer. And most of it, then the rest of it will be planted after harvest. And uh, we've run clear in until uh, 1st of December. Uh, you won't see much rye after Thanksgiving. Uh, it will root down. And uh, in the spring, uh, if we get a little snow on it, it'll be green when it comes up in the spring. And we get really good growth. It does. It, we get a lot better growth if we can do it as an interseeding, but uh, we still get enough to protect the soil over the winter, uh, even though it's small, you know. What are you using to mill your green? Uh, we're using a uh, two stone mills. One's a 30-inch stone mill, and the other one's a 24. It has two granite stones in it. Where you plant your pumpkins, do you do... What do you do with pumpkins? Uh, usually we have, we have a two pick. So we have about five acres of pumpkins uh, set up there. So we operate, we try to open up about the 15th of September and run till the 15th of October. And uh, we'll have uh, pumpkins, uh, short bales of straw, 24 inch long bales of straw that you can put it in a plastic garbage bag and uh, corn fodder to make uh, corn shocks out of, you know. What covers do you plant the pumpkins into? Do you uh, we right? plant, uh, uh, we'll plant, at, you know, it's usually it goes from a, uh, from a small field that we'll use rye and hairy vetch and uh, winter pea in uh, to build the nitrogen so we don't have to put any nutrients on our pumpkins. Do you do that in the same spot every year, or do you move it around? Or? No, we move, we move around just so we don't have to worry about uh, gray leaf spot and that kind of stuff, you know, try to keep the soil more virgin for the pumpkins. So you don't use any herbicide, but if you do use some herbicide, where do you use that? Yeah. Uh, we don't use any herbicides on our uh, our artisan grains or our pumpkins. We may have to use some on our non-GMO corn and beans that we grow for the cash market. Uh, and that only happens maybe uh, twice out of five years. And we, we reduced our, our input costs by 75% on on uh, nutrients and about 92 percent on herbicides so, so you're using the rye as your weed control 
instead of those two crops that instead of, instead of beans. And, yes, that's right. yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Do you ever have to, on the kill the ride? Do you ever have to use anything, or does roller crimper pretty much get it? If we can, if we can get it to uh, anthesis, where it's starting to bloom. Uh, the royal will take it out, but if we have a spring where it don't get that way uh, because of, uh, well, I'm going to say, a shorter growing season in the spring, we will probably have to take it out with a herbicide. I don't think we have that good of an option up here. Probably not. Probably not. You know, as cold as you guys are. Right. Right. No, we really found that our crop roller helps us if we lay that residue down on the surface, when a plant comes up, it don't get spindly. Uh, it tends to elongate. You know, if you don't roll that cover and it's trying to get to the sunlight, the plant will elongate. This corn will, the stem on a corn plant will get smaller, and so will the same on a soybean. You know, so if we lay it down, we see that the plants tend to be have a better stalk to them. If you understand what I'm trying to say. Right. How long will you wait? What's the longest you'd like to go? Or? Uh, we've rolled beans at the second leaf stage and got along fairly well. Uh, we've rolled corn uh, at uh, second leaf on corn uh, and not had a problem. It looks pretty ugly, but it comes right out of it. Have you tried not rolling, crimping the rye and just let it go? I think Rick Clark did some of that yeah uh we have but like i say sometimes with the ride being as tall as it is normally the plants get awful steadily looking for sunlight and then they tend to want to fall over once they start putting seed pods on them or putting seed on you know so i really prefer to roll uh after we're done planting lay that residue down Are you worried about any of that cover crop going to see like the buckwheat or anything like that or your sunflowers? Uh, I guess I, if I was organic, I would, yes. But since we're, since we always have a, a ability to put a post herbicide on, I don't worry about it. Uh, and it's never been a problem. You know, buckwheat's never been a problem as far as I can see in our corn bean rotation. Um, to correct a problem that we have to correct it, you know. They say once you get hairy rye, you always have, or hairy vet, you always have hairy vet, but you just look at it as a beneficial plant. Yeah, I and and, um, and I think sometimes you know uh, uh, an open can of two four D on a fence post will damn near take it out. You know, it don't take much herbicide to take it out if you got a problem. I've never seen it come back enough uh you know we even get a reddish to come back every now and then but uh they've never been a problem for us to uh, worry about what chemicals do you use what we may have to use something uh, our burn down would be uh would be uh, a paraquat, or we're we're trying we're experimenting with uh, with two quart of vinegar, two gallon of vinegar, and uh, water to see if we can get a, with a citric acid as a as an agent in the water. So uh, seems to work fairly well. Last year we used it as a burn down, and it worked great for us. Off the you made a comment about you reduced your nutrient content 75%. Are you kind of just down to a just a cypress nitrogen program, or is, is nitrogen the last guy you're working with? Or, or I mean, you're, you're letting the uh, most of the things that we're working with right now is just nitrogen. We've dropped out the phosphorus in a pot 
uh, ash the last seven years. I haven't used any. Uh, we see that some of the plants we're using in our cover crop mix are bringing phosphorus and potash or making it available in the soil. soil. Um, I haven't figured out yet whether they pull it up from down below or whether it's just the enzymes off the roots that make it make the unavailable phosphorus and potash available, but we're seeing readings coming up in our soil samples. And nitrogen seems to be the thing that we have to add a little bit to uh, to maximize our yields. I mean, I guess I'm not happy with 150 bushel corn with no nitrogen. If we put, uh, if we put uh, 10 gallon 28 on, which would be 28 pounds of bought nitrogen, we can go go to 190 or 200 bushel corn. So that's pretty economical for us to add a little bit to boost them yields up there, you know. Do you have any opinions on using livestock for removing, like, so rather than rolling your eye, or if you put in livestock and say graze it 50% off and then plant into that, would that work, you think, or not? Uh, that was our reason for trying sheep this year. Uh, we tried cattle a year before and saw some benefit, and we thought if we could do a little better job of mob grazing, uh, control their urine and their uh, stools. Uh, I'd like to get them a lot closer than we did with the cattle, and I think we accomplished that with the sheep. I think maybe we can just totally eliminate all of our nutrient program. That's our goal for this year, to see if it'll work. How many sheep does it take, you know, say per cow to get where you want to do? Uh, well, we had 247 on two acres and it lasted for two days. And I thought it worked really well. Uh, but we had about 38,000 pounds of green biomass on the ground when we brought the sheep in. Uh, the thing we noticed after we had a heavy frost that, that, um, slowed the growth of things down. It, it made the brassicas in our mix, uh, they seemed to go after them a lot harder. And then we d couldn't keep the, uh, we couldn't keep 50% cover. We had to move them more often. So we was moving about every day on two acres when you had 247 ewes in the field, you know. Well, David, I really appreciate you doing this for us. Uh, we really wish you'd have been here for some better interaction, but uh, maybe we'll get you up here sometime. We'll do that. Do that. Thank you very much for allowing me to share with you today. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, David. Let's give him a hand.